Tonight, Governor Matawale says he will continue to dialogue with the bandits in order to secure the release of the abducted 300 schoolgirls as federal government delegation visits Zamfara State. A happy homecoming for the Kagara schoolboys as they finally reunite with their parents and loved ones. Tuesday, March 2nd, that's the day the federal government will take delivery of about 4 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines. Dangote Refinery rolls out its first batch of urea fertilizer this week. And Myanmar police opened fire on protesters, killing at least 18 persons in deadliest day of protests. Plus sports and international news. Now the over 300 secondary school girls abducted from their hostel at the government secondary school Jangade in Zamfara State are spending their third night in the den of the abductors, with the federal government still promising to secure their release. A federal government delegation visited Guso, the state capital, today, where it gave the assurance of ensuring the safe return of the girls to the state governor and to their parents. Governor Bello Matawale, however, asked for more security reinforcement to enable success of the rescue operation. The state government has also denied the purported report of the release of the girls. It's the third day since the abduction of over 300 students of the government girls' junior secondary school, Jangebe. And the federal government delegation is here to convey the government's support for the people and government of Zamfara states. Yeah. Minister of Aviation Hadi Sirika leads the team to the Zamfara state government house, where he assured Governor Matawali of the president's commitments uh, towards the safe return of the students. His Excellency is conscious and aware and saddened by the event that led to the abduction of the children, girls in Jengebi. He has condemned in the strongest terms this act and assured that these children will be back and united with their families, inshallah. He said we should commend their efforts and the efforts of their government in steering the affairs of this state and doing your best to promote the well-being of the citizens of this state. Although such and rescue operation is currently ongoing across the state by security operative, Governor Bello Matawali still solicit for more security reinforcement. But because of the huge landmass of the state and different camps of the leaders of these mandatory activities, we need more and more presence of security in such areas. At a meeting with traditional rulers, Governor Matawale encouraged them to continue to provide useful information to government and security operatives while he continues to hold dialogue with the bandit for the safe return of the goals. We are working hard. Those that subscribe to our peace team, they are working for the first two days to see the safe returns of the children. There was also a purported release of the abducted girls, but the state government has dispelled, while it continues to intensify efforts to rescue the girls. Idris Jubrin, Channels Television News. The Pope has also condemned the kidnapping of the Jangebe schools girls, describing it as vile. The Pope said in his Twitter message that he joins the bishops of Nigeria in condemning this vile abduction of the 317 young girls, noting that he's praying for the girls so they might return home and that he is near to their families. The Pope also spoke about the incident after the weekly Sunday Anglos address to Catholic faithful on St. Peter's Square in the Vatican. The Niger State, where all of the 52 rescued, kidnapped victims of the Government Science College in Niger State have been reunited with their families less than 48 hours after they were released from the bandits' hideout. 
The 24 students, six workers and eight of their relatives were handed over to their families and loved ones after proper profiling by the state government. But the Niger state government is not sure when the boarding schools that were shut will reopen as a result of insecurity in the state. Emotions are high as students and staff of the government science secondary school Kagara reunite with their families. It's a happy homecoming for them as they are back in the arms of their loved ones after about two weeks in captivity. We thank God and all the people who were instrumental in our rescue from these kidnappers who have been terrorizing people around the state. For the students, I hope this will not deter you from uh, continuing pursuing your education because it is very important. This education that uh, is the weapon for you to fight those people who are fighting you. Although these ones are happy to have their lives back, they still live in fear just like many others in the state. We are all aware that uh, we are actually facing a lot of heavy attacks by these bandits. And um, when it comes to the issue of schools and our students, it is a very, very de delicate issue. And um, already government is doing everything possible. We're talking to our stakeholders. We're talking to our security agencies to actually know that um, the best approach we would be able to take to be able to allow our students to go back to school. It has been a very harrowing experience. Uh, it's not an experience that uh, ordinarily you say you are pleased with. But um, alhamdulillah, what we have done, uh, I think we've been able to counsel each and every one of the victim because um, there will be follow-up of uh, intense counseling because we need to ensure that they mingle back into society calmly and uh, peacefully. It's, it's not really a joke. The impact of the incident will obviously have a far-reaching effect not just on these students and their parents but on others who may have to stay back at home until security improves. From Niger to Katsina, where the state government has directed the reopening of four boarding schools in the state, effective March 2nd. The directive is coming barely one month after day schools in the state resumed for academic activities, sequel to an indefinite vacation following the abduction of 344 students of the government science secondary school, Kankara, by bandits on December 11th, 2020. The State Commissioner for Education, Professor Badamasi Chiranchi, says male students in the remaining boarding schools should report to any nearest secondary school to their places of abode to continue their studies, while their female counterparts have to wait further instructions from the government. The Commissioner further explains that the Katsina State, uh, that Katsina State had about 38 boarding schools. In the meantime, there's been another deadly attack in Kaduna State, this time in two local government areas of Igabi and Kajuru, where bandits killed at least seven persons today. A statement by the State Commissioner for Internal Security and Home Affairs, Samuel Arwan, says the armed bandits attacked Kanjiriji village, where they killed two residents, while one person sustained gunshot injuries and is receiving treatment at a nearby hospital. Similarly, in Rago village, also of Igabi local government area, bandits killed two residents. In a separate incident, gunmen also invaded Kuturu, Kutura station in Kajuru local government area, where they also killed three persons. Kaduna state has been at the center of bandit attacks in recent times. We're in Delta State now. In the southern part of the country, police authorities have uncovered a shallow grave of 54-year-old Philomena Ogadi from Otolopo Ika North local government area, who was kidnapped and murdered by her abductors. The perpetrators buried her around the area despite requesting and receiving a huge ransom from her children. Working on a lead, the police is led by the suspects to uncover a shallow grave where Philomena Ogadi's abductors had buried her after killing her despite collecting ransom from her son. Arriving the scene of the crime, the victim's son lets out his emotions 
not believing that his mother, late Philomena Ogadi, was murdered by her abductors. <laughs> The digging begins and her corpse is exhumed and taken to the morgue. Back at the state headquarters in Asaba, the police explains the circumstances surrounding her abduction and eventual murder. She was kidnapped by these suspects who allegedly had some business dealings with the victim's children. Failure on the part of her children to share the financial proceeds with the suspects resulted to her abduction. The, one of them said that the, the child of that woman is holding her 3.5, that is his boss, and he betrayed him. So she should go and carry the woman. So when we get there, in the morning, the woman now saw their faces. Then he now said that we should finish the woman. I paid 200 for UBA. They still call me today, uh, day before yesterday. I paid ransom of uh, 800,000 naira. That the same day, I paid ransom of uh, 100,000 again. Yesterday, here, yeah, I paid ransom of 350,000 naira. All this was, you no, know, they don't kill my mother already. The police also gives an account of what transpired, disclosing that two of the eight kidnapped gang syndicate have been arrested, while the police is still on the trail for the other six persons. The woman was shot and killed. Then they tie her face, dug a shallow grave, and buried her inside. With her hands up, What then happened? Negotiation for payment of ransom started. For now, investigation is still ongoing as the police hope to charge all suspects to court and for the law to take its full course. Staying with insecurity, the Imo State Governor Hopuzo Dema has been speaking on recent happenings in Imo State from the military operation in Olu to the impasse between the Imo State Government and former Governor Rocha Sokorocha. At a stakeholders meeting held at the headquarters of the Imo State Council of Traditional Rulers in Oweri, the state capital, the Governor noted that his priority is to take Imo to enviable heights while ensuring lives and property are secured. <laughs> It's the fourth stakeholders meeting organized by Governor Opuzo Dima since he became governor in January 2020. Seated here are traditional rulers, clergymen, political appointees, youth groups, amongst others. Without much ado, Governor Opuzo Dima speaks on the aim of the stakeholders meeting, which is to keep Imo indigents abreast with recent happenings, first on the Olu incident. Mark of is cheap for anyone to clear that what happened in Olu was a military invasion. The military is in Olu to protect our people from bloodthirsty missionaries who were killing, maiming, and raping our people. Then, on the findings of the judicial panel of inquiry, the indicted Senator Rocha Sokorocha. Sokorocha and his cronies, instead of going to the commissions to clear their names, rushed to court to vainly try to stop the commissioners from doing their jobs. If they were innocent, would they try to get me to stop the commission? No. Or would they have gone to court to stop the same purpose? No. Afterwards, some notable leaders in the state were given the opportunity to make some comments. You have spoken to us as a governor. You have spoken to us as a leader, you have told us what you are doing. And for that, we are grateful. I am particularly grateful. There can only be one governor at a time. There can only be one person who will lead this state. Ours is to make the best we can do with our governor and give him our maximum support. We support wholly, in totality, the safe taking so far by presidency, the governor of the state. The governor has promised to make this stakeholders meeting a continuous one, 
so Imo Indigens can be up to speed with its programs and policies. Channel's television news. And in part two after the break, federal government to take delivery of about 4 million doses of AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine on Tuesday, March 2nd. That's the moment. Join us again. Welcome back. If it is John, it's to watching the news at 10 live on channels, television, Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Governor Matawale says he will continue to dialogue with bandits uh, to secure the release of the abducted 300 schoolgirls as federal government delegation visits Zamfara State. A happy homecoming for the Kagara schoolboys as they finally reunite with their parents and loved ones. Tuesday, March 2nd is the day the federal government will take delivery of about 4 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines. The Angotari refinery rolls out its first batch of urea fertilizer this week. And Miyama police opened fire on protesters, killing at least 18 persons in deadliest day of protests. I told you before the break about the Imo State's Governor Hopu Zodima speaking on the recent happenings in Imo State and his grouse with the former Governor Rocha Sokorocha. Have a re response now from the former Governor's camp, a son in law to Rocha Sokorocha, who was allegedly shot in a wherry. The Imo State capital, when thugs suspected to be loyal to the state government attacked the former Governor, will be flown abroad for treatment after, the three, after three field surgeries. Dr. Uzo Amuka, an American-trained medical doctor, was shot in the left leg by hoodlums who were allegedly mobilized by one of the aides to Governor Hope Uzo Dimma. Speaking in Abuja after visiting his son-in-law at a private hospital, the former governor, who is also senator, representing Imo West, says he was attacked when he attempted to unseal one of his properties, the Royal Spring Palm Hotel, seized by the state government. Describing the attack as sad, the governor and former governor, beg your pardon, insists it was an assassination attempt on his life, stating that his major concern is to save the life of his son-in-law. I came to see Dr. Uzo. My lord, I was shot at the uh, Royal Spring Palm Hotel. But I'm... I'm what I'm concerned now is about his life, but I think I thank God that he's alive. But uh, the report I'm getting is not quite pleasing from the hospital regarding the three surgeries so far conducted since arrival. And um, we're hoping that he should fly out of the country immediately for, for to further examination. Um, it's it's um, really sad that... Uh, this attempt to, um, this assassination attempt um, has result to this, what we find ourselves today. But I thank God he's alive. But uh, we are quickly making arrangements with the hospital to move him out of this place um, to see whether he can get examination. Because three surgeries, the three surgeries are taking place. Um, they are suggesting that he might be needing a transplant to cut in part of his body for another this and all that. But we're hoping things get better. And in River State, Governor Nyesu Mwike is pledging his government support for the police in the state to tackle the recent spate of kidnappings and other forms of criminality. The governor stated this when he received the new police commissioner posted to River State, Eboka Friday, and his management team at Government House, Port Harcourt. Before his arrival as the 42nd Commissioner of Police in River State, Governor Yesom Wiki had expressed reservation about CP Friday Eboka's posting. However, this is an opportunity for both men whose responsibility is to protect lives and property to meet with each other. 
the Commissioner of Police assures Governor Wiki of his commitment to professionalism as he informs the Governor of the disbandment of a unit of the tactical team called Eagle Crack Squad for complaints of extortion and human rights abuses. I want to assure you that any assistance given to us will be to improve the security of this state. On my assumption of office, I had a meeting, meeting with my DPUs and other senior officers, and they warned to wake up and be up and doing, because in my administration, there's no room for armchair policing. They have been warned to shun corruption and be safe to members of the public. Despite his initial reservations, Governor Wiki promises to adequately fund the police as he advises the new commissioner against involvement in politics. We have to make sure that things are done properly. Anything you want, let us let the government know to fight crime. But please, in the name of God, don't involve yourself in uh, politics, I beg you. There's nobody I cannot work with. No, there's no one person. In as much as you have come to fight crime, I'm ready. With this level of commitment between the River State Government and the police, in addition to the first action of the Commission of Police in disbanding the Eagle Crack Squad following reports of extortion, River State residents may be in for a better policing regime. Former President Scott Jonathan has asked the governor of Bielsa State, Adoye Deere, to invest more in education for the transformation of the state. Dr. Jonathan gave the charge as a grand reception in honor of the governor at Kayama Town, where he also called on politicians in the state to work with the governor, leaving their political bias behind. If you read the history of Singapore, you'll know that the first priority of the president that transformed Singapore from third world to first world focused on education. You liberate the mind of the people. When you liberate the mind of the people, those people will be so enlightened that they're able to do the right thing. So the governor did our chance for you, and of course we'll work with you is to see how we'll improve the quality of education in the state. And I believe everybody here, and those listening to us, Bayasans and meant well for Bayasa State, will work with you to improve on our state. The chairman of the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19, Mr. Boss Mustafa, has confirmed the first tranche of COVID-19 vaccines will arrive in the country on Tuesday, March 2nd. Mr. Mustafa says the first shipment of 3,924,000 doses of vaccines is coming from COVAX, a World Health Organization-backed initiative set to procure and ensure equitable distribution of vaccines to countries. He explains that the United Nations Children's Emergency Fund will be organizing the shipment from Mumbai, India, and it will arrive in Abuja on March 2nd, 2021. The PTF chairman also appeals to Nigerians to maintain personal hygiene and follow COVID-19 safety guidelines. Like I said, bearing any change because uh, the logistical arrangements and other things are in the hands of the UNICEF. Uh, we believe that our vaccines should depart India on the 1st of March uh, 2021 at 10.30 p.m. in the night and arrive at Abuja on the 2nd of March 2021 at about 11.10 uh, a.m. in the morning. So we are making preparation for that. But the truth about it is that uh, as we receive the vaccines, uh, this one is coming from the COVID facility. Uh, about 4 million uh, doses of vaccines are coming from the COVID facility on this one trip. Uh, we're supposed to have about uh, 60 million in the first quarter from the COVAX facility. And uh, expecting by the time they supply all the range, uh, they, uh, we are expecting that they will supply about 84 million.
doses from the COVAS facility, which is free of charge and is supposed to cover about 20% of the Nigerian population. Uh, we also have another source of vaccines coming in from the AVAT facility, which is the African Vaccine Action Team. Uh, we are expecting about um, 41 million of that, a combination of AstraZeneca and uh, Johnson & Johnson. Uh, everything we are expecting from the uh, COVAX facility, I believe, is going to be the AstraZeneca, which has uh, a good range in terms of storage for us. When the news of turn returns, first batch urea fertilizer from Dangote Refinery and Fertilizer Plant hits local market this week. Stay with us. Welcome back. Former governor of Anambra State, Peter Obi, says Nigeria needs to change its strategy towards the procurement of vaccines for the COVID-19 pandemic. A former vice presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party says because the country is very poor with many mouths to feed, it needs more focus on getting as much as it can for very little or no cost at all. He told Channel Television's Ladia Kredulale on our Current Affairs program, Newsnight, that he would be happy to lead such a mission to seek the world's help. They said they, they need 400 billion. Our budget for health this year is for 547 billion naira. And you're saying that you need 80% of that for, for first procurement, assuming that's what we are going to use the money, or we're going to find new money. And I've checked the vaccines we need in order to have 70%, which WHO stipulated we, that if they receive it, it's okay. And the quantity we need cannot cost us more than 150 billion. In fact, the whole thing is, the way it's turning out now, it will be less, because there's so many people who are prepared to donate for free. So why don't we beg them to donate and say we don't have anything? When we now see the donations we are going to get free and everything, then we know the ones who will buy and go to this manufacturer and say, please, we are from a poor country. Give us discount. That's why I said I can lead them. We go and kneel down and say, listen, we are a poor country. There's nothing saying, saying that you are poor is not a crime. Because you are poor. Because you have poor people, poor people who can feed. So why are you still throwing money away? We can't thank them and they give it to us for free and support us. That's what we need. For the full interview with Mr. Obi, do watch Newsnight tomorrow, Monday, March 1st, right here on Channels Television, airs at 9 p.m. Barring any last-minute changes, the Dangote Refinery Petrochemicals Complex and Fertilizer Plant will ship out the first urea into the domestic market. Speaking during a tour of the facility, the CBN governor, Godwin Imifili, says the Dangote Fertilizer beg your pardon, will help boost agriculture produce in Nigeria. He goes on to say that the 650,000 barrel a day production refinery is expected to be completed in the first quarter of 2022. It is envisaged to see a crude oil feedstock supplied in, Niger in Naira and produced and sold to Nigeria in Naira. And when completed, the $15 billion complex is expected to save the country some 41% in foreign exchange on importation. CEOs and leaders in the various sector arriving in the vicinity of the much-talked-about, never-seen-of-a-kind project from a sub-Saharan country, and thus proudly Nigeria. You have most likely heard about the Dangote refinery somewhere in the outskirts of Lagos, but have perhaps self-generated images of what it really looks like. First off, aside the refinery project, Heavy ancillary projects are being built simultaneously and have attained high percentage completion. The executives make their initial stop here, 
the export and import terminal of eight lines to convey crude from the vessels arriving connected to a subsea pipe and products line for evacuation of refined products with one of the pipes measuring 48 inches. This is all built up from the scratch. Heavy concrete works, tons and tons of iron and cement. So is this the refinery? Of course not. Another drive is initiated to another location within the catchment, and it is a newly developed port. It became necessary to add a port to the refinery project because some of the components required for this 650,000 barrels a day refinery could not be brought in through any of the Nigerian ports owing to the tonnage and moving them beneath the Lagos bridges. The port here can berth vessels for import and export and already in use, certified and approved. Put together, this has become a part of the Dangote refinery slash petrochemical complex and fertilizer plant. This is the fertilizer plant also on the complex, constructed on a largely formerly swamp water covered area and now fortified with tons of piles and 64 million cubic of sand, built, operational and running. Came as a single piece, yeah. This came as a single piece. Yeah. Oh, yes. We'll yeah. show you in the video. That's how we had to build This week, the first local shipment of urea fertilizer will move into the market from this complex and it's expected to boost food production. Then to the big masquerade, the world's largest single train refinery, a 650,000 barrels per day production capacity, and the petrochemical plant, which will produce polyethylene and polypropylene. These are essential raw materials for plastics. Construction has advanced, projected to be ready first quarter 2022, which will finally put to rest this journey, which was contemplated six years ago and started two years after. To underscore the value addition to Nigeria and the global market, here are some statistics of this huge construction site. The petroleum product from the refinery is calibrated for the Euro 5 quality. The refinery is designed to process large variety of crude, including many of Africans' crude, some Middle Eastern crudes, and U.S. light tight crude. It's also expected to maximize gasoline by 55% production capacity compared to 22% of current refineries. For fuel requirements in Nigeria, when compared to products from the Dangote refinery, output from refining here is projected at 57 million liters of gasoline against 33 million daily demands, which represents a surplus of 24 million liters per day. Kerosene will stand at 11 million from Dangote refinery against 8 million daily consumption, that's a 2 million liter extra. For jet fuel, 9 million against 1 million consumption daily in Nigeria, an excess of 8 million liters. For diesel, 27 million production, 10 million required, an excess of 17 million. So a total of 103 million various derivatives of petroleum products will be produced here. The four-time caller to this complex who has seen the various developmental stages feels fulfilled. Based on agreement and discussions with NNPC or with the oil companies, that he could buy his crude in Naira, in Naira, well, sort of, I would say, um, anchored to the 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 plat, the, 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 plat, the plat, right, and refine it and produce it for Nigerians' use in Naira. So that is where the element where FX is saved for the country becomes very, very clear. The Media Powerhouse Executive aligns with the economic gains and prospects. Having gone around this uh, five hours or more, um, you know, it's, one is really speechless. All you can say is that, you know, God bless Aliko Dangote, because this is going to impact on the, on, on the country and the foreign exchange it's going to impact on, on Nigerians. It's going to impact on the economy positively. He saw it before we all did. If Aliko you know, Dangote. You know, go to some of these beaches. You see massive line of ships, especially at night. All those ships that are just carrying petroleum products, be it gas, be it diesel. You know, so they are here 
capturing the market of Nigeria and other, you know, West African countries. And all that will stop. Certainly. Okay? All that will stop. Nigeria now is not going to... You see, because if you look at it now today, once you say that it is November, NMPC's, uh, I mean, uh, PPMC's focus is let us make sure that there's no shortage during Christmas. Christmas. It's not going to happen. Okay? So people who are tying down their money, okay, all the economic activities of petroleum products will now remain internally in Nigeria. In the line of sight is the tape cutting to climax all of this. We are told the days behind are the longest. Ulu Phillips, Channel Television News. Cadbury Nigeria PLC producers of Bon Vita Cocoa Beverage has rewarded the top three winners in the second edition of its Born Factor Talent Hunt competition. The winners were unveiled at a prize presentation ceremony in Lagos. Divine Promotion Nursery and Primary School, Ileife Oshun State, won the grand prize of three million naira. At the occasion, the managing director of Cadbury West Africa, Mrs. Oye Yemika Adeboye said the company seeks to promote talents outside the classroom while promoting the tradition of giving back to society. Cadbury Nigeria PLC, manufacturers of the Born Vita Coco beverage, welcomes a small group of people to its headquarters in Lagos in line with the COVID-19 protocols. It's time to reward winners of the second edition of the Born Factor Talent Hunt. In season one, when we had uh, 183 schools in 2019, um, the number of jars um, that were submitted was 800,000 jars, covers. For season two, with less schools, 2.7 million. As teachers and schools, what we're appealing to you to continue to do is to invest in these children, not just in um, curricula, classroom work, but also in extracurricular. Before the awards, the official in charge of innovation explains the modalities of the competition and how winners were chosen. Gather empty jars and sachets of Bonvita as a school, bring it together to the school and submit together as a school. Now there's a minimum entry point of 20,000. Now once you gather jars and sachets, minimum of 20,000, you enter, qualify for the competition. Now after that, we ask the school to do a recording five minutes or six minutes or three minutes video of any talent you decide. It could be drama, it could be singing, it could be choreography. A representative of the first placed school, Divine Promotion Nursery Primary School based in Ileife Oshun State, steps out to receive the three million naira prize. The first prize winner from Ileife is Divine Promotion Nursery and Primary School. An Ogun State based school Success Foundation Academy comes second and takes two million naira home. Congratulations. Potter and Clay Primary School in Ilesha, also in Oshun State, is third and receives one million naira. The school administrator is super excited. And we're going to do, we're going to enhance our playground area because it's talking about talents. We want them to actually play, not work, 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 work. So this is a very, very good innovation from Cadbury and it's going to enhance the school. Introduced in 1960, Born Vita is Cadbury Nigeria PLC's flagship brand, relaunched in a world-class thermoplastic jar in 2011. And the company says it remains a market leader in the food and drinks category. And now to the arts. Lagos Loves Gold, organized by Gold West Africa, is a luxury bazaar, an exhibition of works of art. It features a selection of hand-picked Nigerian jewelers and jewelry designers who specialize in gold and over 27 original artworks which talk about the importance of this precious metal. Paintings, jewelry, and ornamental pieces that tell the story of gold are displayed in this space at the commercial city of Lagos to some distinguished guests who came here to enjoy and get more knowledge about this item 
presented at the Gold West Africa exhibition. Today, Gold West Africa presents Lagos Love Gold, which is the fourth installment of gold initiatives that was started in 2020. It started in Kano and then went into Burkina Faso, uh, Ouagadougou, then went to Dakar in the Senegal, and finally ends here in Lagos. Whatever you are doing in Nigeria, and you have not come to Lagos, because Lagos is still the commercial center. So I'm very happy to welcome all of you tonight uh, to start the Lagos Loves Gold. Also, I see someone tonight, because our goal is not just to take gold in its raw form as it's been done now and to take it out of the country. We have values added outside. One of the things we're promoting is to add value locally, to retain the value in Nigeria, and not export the job out there. The works of art show the trade and development of gold and how the timeless treasure is important, not just to women, as seen in many parts of the images displayed, but to men as well, no matter where they come from. This exhibition, which is one of a kind, is unique in many ways, as it features high-value products such as gold chains, rings, bracelets, besides the paintings, and it's also a history lesson for many. So there is so much to learn. So here you see gold in art, gold in design, gold in utility. So for example, you see the paintings um, going through history. Sometimes we have a collection here that's called Worth the Weight, talking about women as the treasuries of gold in West Africa. Then we have um, Mansa Musa, the history and glory of gold in West Africa that we also have gold being mined. So that's the art, and it's also connected to gold. Investing in gold has its rewards, as it never goes out of fashion or season. That's part of what the Gold West Africa exhibition has emphasized to the audience. At least 18 people have been killed across Myanmar after police fired on protesters marking the deadliest day of anti-coup rallies. Uh, protesters, however, remain defiant, saying they will defend themselves if attacked. All across the country on Sunday, police cracked down on anti-coup protesters, scattering crowds in the street with smoke bombs, tear gas and firing guns. <laughs> In the southeastern city of Daewei, one protester was reportedly shot and killed. Police were seen shooting towards protesters from the back of a truck. In the capital Yangon, police fired tear gas, stun grenades and fired shots in the air. A number of protesters were hit in the process. Several of them, some bleeding, were helped away from the area. It's not clear how many were hurt, but local media reports there was live fire. Menit rushed to treat an injured protester in Daiwei as police cracked down on the protests. The media says the Red Cross confirmed the protester was shot in the chest, belly and arm, and that three bullets had been found. They confirmed the shots came from the police. One protester died here and the other in Yangon, but many others were injured. And in Mandalay, protesters were seen carrying the lifeless body of a man shot dead to an ambulance. He'd been on his motorbike when it happened. The bullet pierced his helmet, leaving it drenched in blood. Myanmar has been in chaos since the army seized power and detained elected government leader Aung San Suu Kyi and much of her party leadership on February the 1st, alleging fraud in the November election her party won in a landslide. The coup which brought a halt to tentative steps towards democracy after nearly 50 years of military rule has drawn hundreds of thousands onto the streets and the condemnation of Western countries. Uh, meanwhile, in Hong Kong, police have charged 47 activists with subversion in what is considered the largest use yet of the country's, uh, of the territory's controversial security law. The 47 are among a group of 55 arrested in an early morning raid last month. They were told to report to police stations for detention ahead of court appearances on Monday. The action comes months after Beijing enforced the law criminalizing subversive acts last year, saying they needed to bring stability. A former British colony, Hong Kong, was handed back to China in 1997, but
but under the one country, two systems principle, it was supposed to guarantee certain freedoms for the territory, including freedom of assembly and speech, an independent judiciary and some democratic rights which mainland China does not have. And sports news, Teslim Balogun Stadium in Lagos is set to stage the Africa Cup of Nations qualifying game between the Super Eagles and Lesotho. The three-time African champions will face Lesotho on March 30 in a venue that last hosted the team in 2011. And uh, it's swung across again. At that time, no stopping the Nigerians, no stopping the Super Eagles. This was the Super Eagles of Nigeria in their last game in Lagos in 2011 in a friendly match with Sierra Leone at the Teslim Balogu Stadium. The Super Eagles are returning to the same venue for their final game of the Africa Cup of Nations qualifier against Lesotho in March. Repair works at the Teslim Balogun Stadium are ongoing. Grasses are being planted, while water sprinklers are active to ensure the grasses are lush green ahead of the game. The Lagos State government is confident that they can put up all the necessary measures for the game despite the global coronavirus pandemic. We are ready technically, the grass is ready, the, 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 the technical requirements are ready. We are also hoping that CAF um, uh, accedes to, the, to um, the NFF's request for a percentage of the stadium to have uh, fans in. If we do have fans, then that will be an added, an added bonus. Before now, the three-time African champions played their international games in Port Harcourt, Abuja, Kano, Calabar, Oyo, Benin City and the Sabah. But the Nigeria Football Federation gives reasons for this decision. You see, ours is not just um, moving around. We're also looking at uh, setting factors. For example, when is our next game? After that, we are going to play in Kotonou. So we don't need to fly. So that's one of the reasons why we have to come to Lagos. Lagos is home. Football enthusiasts are excited that the city is hosting the country's first competitive fixture in more than 10 years in a place where the Super Eagles rarely lose. The return of Super Eagles here, I'm sure if the Eagles play well, because that has been the problem, if they don't play well, Lagos fans always support the visiting team, which is playing better. Years ago, when they were using National Stadium, it was all about entertainment. So now that they're coming to Tesla Balogun Stadium here, let them erase that memory of that uh, game versus Sierra Leone and play better football. Let's get to appreciate them, quality football, and I hope get a draw. Somebody must have told him about the attitude and character of the Lagos fans. The game in March could see Lagos become a permanent home for the Super Eagles, pending the completion of the renovation work at the National Stadium in Lagos and Abuja by the federal government. Nakoda FC came from two goals down to beat Kano Pillars 3-2 in the Nigeria Professional Football League Match Day 13 clash at the Nest of Champions in Uyo earlier today. Kano Pillars captain Rabiu Aliu and Jerome Henchong handed the Vistas the lead, but the hosts fired back with goals from Christian Ekpong, Philip Archibong and substitute Isaac George. Aqua United also picked a three points in Uyo following a 3-0 victory against Rivers United. Quara United beat Wari Wolves 2-0, reclaimed top spot in the NPFL. Lobby Stars beat Katsina United 2-1. Rangers International beat Heartland FC by two goals to nil. Arsenal produced another fight back at three goals at three goals in 17 minutes. Either side of halftime gave them a 3-1 victory at Leicester to prevent their forces moving second in the English Premier League early kickoff. After two late goals and them a dramatic Europa League win over Benfica in midweek, Arsenal had to come from behind again to earn three points at the King Power Stadium. Gareth Bale scored twice to made another as Tottenham cruised to an easy Premier League win over Burnley that boosted their hopes of a European qualification. Callum Hudson-Odoi survived VAR penalty called drama as Chelsea and Manchester United played out an uh, all-nil stalemate at Stamford Bridge. 
Nigeria's Olajide Omotayo has set a new African record at the World Table Tennis event after the 2019 African Games champion became the first Nigerian and African to win a match at the WTT Middle East Hub holding in Doha, Qatar. Omotayo, who is competing in his first international tournament after qualifying for the Tokyo Olympic Games at Tunis, began his campaign from the preliminary alongside other African players from Egypt and Algeria. Omotayo defeated Kazakhstan's Allen in the first round of the preliminary to become the only African player to record a victory on the opening day of the tournament. He will face Sweden's Anton Kalberg in the second round on Monday. And the main news again. A federal government delegation today visited Zamfara State following the abduction of over 300 schoolgirls. The state governor, Bello Matawale, promised to continue peace dialogue with bandits to secure release of the girls and end banditry in the state. Also today, Dangote Refinery and Fertilizer Plant announced its first batch of urea fertilizer will hit the local markets this week. And the federal government has announced it will take delivery of about 4 million doses of AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine on Tuesday, March 2nd. About 4 million doses of the vaccine will be delivered on that day. That is the news at 10 tonight. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi Ubani.